Oh boy, we've got something very special today. That is AMD Epic in an AM5 variety. We've been pushing these for years, basically, not under the AM5 name. But AMD has woken up and said, hey, the people want AM5 in uh, Epic, or they want you know to be able to deploy AM5 and have certain assurances. And let me tell you, I am here for it. Wow, these are long overdue. I've got the 4564P and the 4364P. Those are the eight and 16 core varieties. And P at the end, single socket. Yeah, of course, AM5, psh, what are you gonna do? Have a dual AM5 socket? It's funny that you say that because Hygon, remember I reviewed the forbidden servers? Dual AM4 was actually a thing for Hygon, not US market. And as far as I know, it was only experimental. There's some super rare motherboards that have dual Hygon CPUs. If you have one, please let me know. I would really love to have one for my collection. Thank you. Yes, dual AM5 is not, we're not, let's not get off track. I wanna take a look at these two CPUs in the context of a 7950X, a 7900, no X, and a 7700, no X. And in order to do that, we have the Silverstone CS382 system that I put together previously. I've temporarily swapped in a Hyper 212 cooler, tower cooler, because I happen to have the right angle mounting kit for the Hyper 212. I'm not sure if the 212 ships with an AM5 right angle kit, it's just the motherboard that's in here is an ASRock motherboard. It's the B650D4U, and that is a motherboard that has onboard dual 10 gig. I really, I would like to have a better PCIe slot layout, like two X8s and an X4, or X8, X8, X4, X4, or X8, X4, X4, X4. Those are reasonable slot configurations. Nobody's gonna use X16 on AM5. I mean, maybe a Mellanox Connect X5, but a Mellanox Connect X5 Gen 4, like, come on, just X8, X4, 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 or X8, X8, X4, X4. That's what we need. Anyway, we've got 48 gigs of ECC memory that I covered before. This is the system that we're gonna use for that testing, and we're gonna use the Ferronix test suite to do that testing. Now, before we get to the testing, got a little bit of background we need to cover. Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I would have said that AM5 is substantially more sketchy than its AM4 counterpart for server-ish type tasks. AM4 was amazing because AMD offered support for uh, error correcting DIMMs, that is unregistered error correcting DIMMs, registered memory being what you normally find in servers. Things have changed a little bit with DDR5. DDR5 for servers, registered error correcting memory, is physically different than its unregistered error correcting counterparts. And before AMD Agiza 1.2, unregistered error correcting memory support on AM5 was hit and miss at best. It really was a little disappointing with the launch of AM5 because we were immediately checking. And as soon as the 7900's No X launched, I was very excited by boards like the ASRock board here, which I bought with my own money because I'm that excited about it. Now, AMD sent me these CPUs. I like being able to request things, but sometimes I'm impatient and it's just like, I'm going to buy this, I'm gonna try it and it's gonna be great. It didn't, it didn't, it, ECC memory, ECC support on this motherboard was actually worse than desktop motherboards, if you can believe that. And ASRock has a beta BIOS. It's still labeled beta at the time that I'm shooting this video, but it correctly fixes all of the stuff and is necessary for correctly supporting AMD Epic CPUs. And so I think it is fine and good that AMD used their engineering prowess to solve these problems and do the integrations because I don't think the motherboard partners did. Or alternately, motherboard partners that have the engineering resources to do ECC validation and everything else weren't given the time materials or interface to the smart engineers in order to get it done, which I've been worried about for a long time. And so seeing that corrected with the launch of Epic for AM5, you'd be surprised how many people would be perfectly fine with an eight or a 16 core server. And the thing with these is it's high single core clock speed. If you have a small work group of like 10 or 12 people that are copying files at 25 gigabit, eight or 16 cores at four plus gigahertz, because these CPUs have the specifications, will get it done in a way that a 20 core CPU running at two gigahertz just won't. Now while the two CPUs I have are eight and 16 cores, there is a full lineup of CPUs for AM5 that roughly mirror their desktop counterparts, including chips with 3D vCache, the 4584PX, and the 4484 PX with 16 and 12 cores respectively. They still feature 128 megs of L3 cache up to 120 watt and the same 5.7 gigahertz boost frequency of their uh, 16 core non 3D V cache counterparts. 
At the very lowest end of the scale, at 65 watts, you can get four cores and eight threads with 16 megs of L3 cache, 65 watts with a max boost frequency of 5.1 gigahertz. And that one comes in at an MSRP of just 149. So there really is a CPU counterpart to pretty much all of the Ryzen 7000 series desktop counterpart CPUs. Maybe we'll get to take a closer look at some of the other SKUs that are here. I was sort of hoping that the 3 dv cache counterparts would be both CCDs have 3 dv cache. That would be a really interesting part, but it probably also would cost more. And so without further ado, let's talk about our Pharonix results and our Pharonix testing. In this comparison, we've primarily got our Epic 7343 and our 7543, well, basically our eight and our 16 core Epic CPUs. I decided to pit these against the AMD 7700 No X, the 7950X, and the 7900, because I thought these would perform pretty similarly. The first thing I wanted to make sure of was that the memory performance across all of these is exactly the same, and this is with using ECC memory. And I was pleased to see that basically the performance of all three of these CPUs is exactly identical. I also decided to use CBLOSK for, you know, chess benchmarking just to see how things stack up. And it stacks up about like you'd expect. The 7900 is a 12 core part. We have their two 16 core parts and our two 8 core parts. Interestingly, the 7700 and the 7343P are at a strong advantage here for the very small buffer size. And I think that's because with 8 cores, it doesn't have to go across CCD. But if you move up for larger tests, then the Epic 16 core and the 7950X you know, everything lines up about where you'd expect with 12, 16, and eight cores. I also wanted to test seven zip compression and decompression, and everything is about where you'd expect it for eight, 12, and 16 cores. Compiling PHP is a fairly multi-core experience, and so you post the best times on the 16 core parts, followed by the 12 core, followed by the eight core here. Everything is basically lining up the way that I expected. The, the 16 core Epic parts are basically identical to their Ryzen counterparts. It's just a different support structure, different guarantees in an enterprise context. If you're thinking about running one of these for your home server, is it worth the extra money to splurge and get an Epic CPU? These test results show probably not, but if you need the assurance in a data center context, as we've seen in other videos that don't have anything to do with AMD, yeah, you probably do want those assurances. And so the distinction between Epic and Ryzen does actually make sense. Although that AMD 7900 for the price point that it's at and, er and all the features that it offers, it's very, very compelling. As I have said since day one, especially because the Ryzen 7900 has properly working unregistered ECC UDIM support now, pretty much across the board on a lot of other boards. I mean, just look at your Geekbench single core scores. It's basically identical across all of these CPUs, even the eight core 7700. Now the multi-core scores, yeah, you do get some differentiation there because, you know, again, eight, 12, and 16 cores, but these Epic 4004 CPUs really are compelling for light workloads. I'm gonna use this as a comparison basis in a future video to compare against some older, you know, like Broadwell Xeons and older Skylake Xeons, and you'd be surprised. These 16 core parts can go toe to toe with 24 and 28 core parts when we're talking about server CPUs that are that old. Even the DDR5 memory will outperform quad channel memory because, well, it's just so much newer and faster. It seems like the 4564P edges out the 7950X just a little bit. Lower power consumption, slightly better performance. I'm not sure that I would have expected to be able to detect a measurable difference between these two CPUs, but it is, it is there. The eight core performance, I mean, okay. 65 watts, the 7900 comes in, where it comes in, it's a pretty sweet spot for what it is. The 7900 is still an amazing choice for this. And between the 7700 and the 7900 and these Epic P series processors on every board that I tried, ECC support is there. There is functionally no difference between the Epic and desktop counterparts. And in case you're wondering, Epic on a normal motherboard like the X670 Elite AX, which only just got working ECC UDIM support as of the very latest BIOS, you need a Giza 1.2 point something. Well, let's swap out our Ryzen and swap in our eight core 7364P. That's kind of funny because the Epic CPUs are still oriented the correct way in the socket when actually in server boards, the socket is sideways. It's booting. 
This is epic on a desktop platform? Sure, why not? You can go both ways. If you want to do product segmentation, let's talk, uh, let's talk SRIOV. Let's talk, uh, you know, technologies like SEV. Could you do SEV? I mean, 192 gigabytes of RAM on the AM5 platform is a thing that you can do. I also like the pricing for these. The pricing really is not a lot different between the 16 core desktop and this. That may change with the launch of AMD's new desktop CPUs. There may be a 16 core option there that's gonna be a little bit less than its Epic counterpart. And that'll make things really interesting. And I'm sure that I'll have another follow-up video in order to uh, check on that and do stuff with that. And also, how about a sil Silverstone case? There's a separate review on that. Check that out if you're interested. But yeah, Epic in an AM5 socket. And this machine with its eight three and a half inch SATA bays, plus our NVMe connections, plus everything that I've got going on for my PCIe expansion, 25 gigabit out of the box works with this great. What's not to like with AMD Epic on AM5? AMD Epic on AM5 bottom line raises the bar for Ryzen desktop on AM5 as well, especially if you get a more expensive motherboard like this with some of the more enterprisey features like out of band management and you know theoretically error correcting stuff that will report to the IPMI. AMD's got to get some engineering dollars from that somewhere. If motherboard partners like ASRock are going to design boards like this, they need to be able to get support from AMD to do that. And at Computex, we saw a lot of AM5 solutions from ASRock and MSI and integrators that you maybe haven't heard of before, and even high density solutions. Like here is eight AM5 systems in a 4U or a 5U rack system. I want to get some of those. I want to take a look at it. In particular, there was a MeTAC, that's Tyan, Tyan MeTAC system that was multiple AM5 sockets, multiple independent systems, but in one small rack mount chassis. And that was something you could deploy with a high wattage GPU. And with all the kerfuffle lately with Intel, the 13900K and the 14900K, a lot of uncertainty in running those and those sort of cloud gaming workloads with the updates and then stability or instability. There's a lot of people that are really leaning on AMD for those kind of solutions now with both Epic and the 7950X. And this is AMD's time to shine. And with AMD potentially getting a lot of new customers in those game server roles because of the uncertainty and instability around Intel, if AMD really makes sure that those customers have the best possible experience, they're going to lock those customers in for at least two or three more generations, I think. And that's a good move for AMD. And that's probably part of why we see Epic on AM5 in the data center. I'm sure that AMD was looking at, at AM5 in the data center and thinking, what are, what, are, what are people doing? Well, you know, now you know the rest of the story. See also my other video on that. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. I'm signing out, and you can find me in Level 1 forums.